Good morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. I want to talk to you today, my sisters, about the system that is rising to power right now. This is the Antichrist system that has existed throughout the ages, ever since the time of Cain. But it is manifesting now as a global power headed up by a global religion. And for that reason, we who are Christians want to be aware of its characteristics, but we also want to be aware that we have nothing to fear from this system. So a psychopath is something that I have some familiar familiarity with, having dealt with a few. And some things that we can notice about psychopaths is that they they hate goodness. They are full of lies and falsity, and for that reason, they fear and hate the truth. And they use uh, things like accusation and manipulation. They enjoy power, and they seek power, and they abuse it when they get it. They, they bribe people. They entice people to complicity with them through bribery. They use flattery seduction, manipulation, deceit, and they exploit the goodness in others in order to achieve evil ends. Now, that's quite a bit of stuff that we could attribute to a psychopath, and these things are written of in the scripture, in particular in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 5, and we can read this together today, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So this is written in the scripture, and many people these days can see these characteristics manifesting in the world around them, and also in the various people who have power in this world. Now, what I want to talk to you about, though, today is a little bit different. We're not going to focus on the characteristics of evil, because to do so is not particularly edifying. What this video is about is more about how we as Christians don't need to fear this, and how God is still God. And if we're relying on him, we have nothing to fear or worry about. In verse 13 of Second Timothy chapter 3, we, we read, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we see in this particular chapter of the letter that the Apostle Paul, our brother Paul, wrote to Timothy, that there's a contrast between psychopathic rulers and psychopathic people and those who abide in the word of God. And that we who are Christians, we continue in the word of God and we do the things that Jesus Christ commanded. Now, there are, there are people who, who don't like to hear about obedience. They, they mistakenly believe that obedience has to do with self-will and hypocrisy. And they think these things because they've encountered a lot of 
self-will and hypocrisy and the various religious systems of this world, which are not godly. Therefore, they have a hatred for hypocrisy. They have a hatred for narcissism, which is self-idolatry and pride. And because they've been exposed to hypocrisy, they mistakenly believe that those who are obedient unto Jesus Christ, and particularly those who have been, who have been sanctified by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they are of that seed, that they're of a Pharisee-like seed, that they're self-righteous hypocrites. And what I want to say about this is that righteousness, the righteousness of a Christian is not their own self-will. It's not themselves making themselves look holy. Rather, a Christian is someone who is cleaned on the inside of their cup, on the inside of their vessel, by having the blood of Jesus Christ applied to them in baptism. The scripture says in Acts 2 verse 38 that baptism is for the remission of sins. And this is God's answer to the hypocrisy of religious people who held to the law without worshiping God in spirit. So they held to the outward form of the law, but they didn't have the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law is love. Jesus Christ said that the greatest commandment of all was to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And that this love is the fulfillment of the law. These days, a lot of people misunderstand love, and they misunderstand mercy. They think that love is being permissive and not challenging the things that are evil. And they think that mercy is to, to be silent about sin. But the Bible says that to love our neighbor means that we don't suffer sin upon them, that we offer them the truth about salvation in Jesus Christ, which is this. Pardon me. The truth, excuse me, my phone that never rings just rang. So the, the truth of Jesus Christ and the truth about salvation is that you don't have to be in bondage to sin anymore. Those who have had some experience in life know that sin harms you. It harms the people who are involved in it, and all of us were born into sin. And the mercy of God was that he provided for us a way to be free from living in sin, that we don't have to be living in the darkness anymore, that we can be perfect even as he is perfect. However, religious people, and, and I say this with all due respect, because someone who's in this condition can repent of it. However, religious people who think that they can't be saved from their sins because they've been, fault, they've been taught a false gospel, so they are not unaware of the way of salvation, that they think it's very unkind to say things like that we can be perfect. They think it's a, a manifestation of pride. So I want to go to the scripture, first of all, to, to correct this misunderstanding. And, and with all due respect, it's not because I am anything. It's the word of God is everything. And if we go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse, let's start with, uh, let's start with uh, verse 44. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Love your enemies, bless them that cur curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. 
when Christians talk about being perfect, it's about being made perfect in love. You see, when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, and we receive the Holy Ghost, which is the Spirit of God that dwelled in Jesus Christ, now is dwelling in us, that then we have the power to overcome sin and walk in the light and manifest the love of Jesus Christ to the world. And this is not an unforgiving, angry, bitter spirit that, or self-righteous or proud spirit that we manifest to people. Rather, it's the love of God and the truth about salvation. And the being perfect means to be perfect in love. To be perfect in love means that you can love someone who is actively harming you. So we're coming around now to the topic of the psychopathic system of control that is rising to power right now. It's easy to fall into fear and bitterness, anxiety, anger, desperation, despair, depression, when we see these things happening in the earth. And that, of course, is part of what the system is trying to evoke in the human heart. One thing a psychopath will do is it will harm you. A psychopath will harm you and then represent itself to you as your rescuer in order to create dependency upon it. And that's what this psychopathic system is currently doing. It's taking things from people that are naturally God-given rights that every person has, the ability to freely associate with people, the ability to work, the ability to provide for one's family, the ability to go outside and enjoy God's creation, the ability to speak one's opinion about things. And the system is removing all those rights from people in the name of it's what's good for you. And at the same time, giving you bribes, giving you money, uh, promising you protection, and so forth, and so on. So it's a psychopathic system that's rising now. It's really easy to be angry about it or to have contempt for those who are kind of falling for its trickery. But as Christians, we don't want to allow the psychopath to corrupt us, which is one thing a psychopath will do. So they'll try to entice you into doing something that Christians are commanded not to do. Jesus Christ, let's read about Jesus Christ. And hold on just a moment. Second Peter 2, 23. Second Peter, that's not right. Let's try First Peter 2, 23. Maybe that's where it is. Yes, okay. So this is... A description of Jesus Christ and actually let's let's begin starting in verse 19 for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endured grief suffering wrongfully for what glory is it if when you were buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently but if when ye do well and suffer for it ye take it patiently this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto ye were called, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. So Jesus Christ was our example, that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin? Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So the Son of God, when he was mistreated, when he was betrayed, when he was reviled, when he was killed, he didn't retaliate. He trusted God to see these things, and he trusted God, to his Father, to judge righteously. Verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, 
dead to sins, not continuing in sins and not having consequence for sin. Being dead to sins so we're able to live in holiness. This is what salvation is. That we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. So the way of salvation is to be able to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect, by loving our enemies, praying for people who harm us, and doing good even when we're reviled and persecuted. In Matthew, we read about being perfect. Let's read another example of the same teaching from Jesus Christ in the book of Luke. So Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6, and here we'll read the same, pardon me, Luke chapter 6 and verse 36. This is the same time that Jesus was speaking, and we'll begin in verse 35 just to demonstrate that. But love your enemies, and do good, and land hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. The commandment to be perfect is not to have a perfectly clean house, my sisters, not to never make a mistake, not to to memorize the entire Bible and be able to recite it word for word. That's not the kind of perfection that Jesus Christ was commanding his disciples to endeavor to have. He was talking about being merciful. Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he prayed, for the people who were crucifying him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, prayed for the men who were stoning him. He said, lay not this sin to their charge. This is to be perfect. This is the kind of perfection that we as Christians want. So it's about our heart, not our work, not what we do, not how many tracks we pass out. And we should pass out tracks, of course, but it's not about how much we do. It's about the power of God in us. I want to tell you about a psychopathic system. A psychopathic system wants to corrupt the people that it wants power over. It wants to entice them to, to worship it rather than worship the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. It wants to entice us to depart from speaking the truth unto people in love. It wants us to be fearful. It wants us to be angry. It wants us to revile. It wants us to return evil for evil. But we want to be very careful because this is contrary to what Jesus Christ commanded us. And those who love Jesus Christ keep his commandments. Let's go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. One thing I want to say before I go any further is that when we see evil taking place, it is not loving to not mention it. When we see wrongdoing occurring, it is not loving to, to uh, be an innocent bystander, as it were, to, to be fearful for what might happen to us if we do something to defend the poor or to defend the homeless or to, to stand up and, and say that something is wrong. Jesus was not a wimp. 
and pardon me for that language, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus Christ had no trouble pointing out when there was wrongdoing, when there was hypocrisy, when there was pride. And he spoke those things because to speak those things might convict someone and bring them to repentance. And that's why he came, was to save those who were lost. He came to, to bring people back into covenant with their God. So speaking about hypocrisy is not reviling. Speaking about wrongdoing is not reviling. Reviling is when someone accuses you falsely, and then you respond to that by pointing out how evil they are. That is what reviling is. When people come against us personally, then then that's a different thing entirely. Then it's not about, oh, wait a minute, you don't know my heart, or you're just an evil person because you're attacking me. No, Jesus Christ didn't do that, and we don't do it. So when he was reviled, he reviled not again. In James chapter 2, let's read here in verse 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves." If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, a Christian, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, continues in the word of God by being obedient to it. We don't look into the word of God and not apply it to ourselves. So when Jesus Christ commanded that when people persecute us, we should pray for them. When he commanded us to rejoice when people hate us for telling the truth, that our reward is great in heaven. These things were not light things. He wasn't, these weren't good suggestions, as a dear brother often says. These are commandments. When we're commanded to love our enemies and to do good to those who despitefully use us, and forsake us, that includes those who are be, have been given over to the power of darkness in this time. We don't become their assistants. We don't do what they command if it's contrary to the Lord of God, word of God. We hold ourselves to the scripture and we speak the truth in love. And we do it in a loving way. We don't do it in an angry way. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1. Proverbs 15 and verse 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. I am not at all saying that people won't continue to hate you or me or revile you or me or even kill you or me if we speak the truth about salvation and Jesus Christ unto them. Verily, we know that that can happen to us because it happened to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. However, when we speak softly unto evil and mercifully, as Christian women in particular, so we speak the truth unto people in love and we trust that God will judge all things, then our eternal life is protected in him. Then our heart is safe. You see, a psychopath likes to corrupt you. Have you ever dealt with someone who did something wrong 
to you and you got angry and you said something about it, maybe to them, maybe to someone else, and afterward, afterward you felt defiled, you felt like you had become corrupted. Well, that's the intention of this whole system. It's to get you mad about it. It's to get you indignant and angry and, and to be reviling the people who are doing these things and speaking evil of them. And then you've been corrupted. Rather, we can speak the truth about the evil that is being done. And we can encourage people to come to repentance, realizing that the power of God unto salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I'm talking about someone who's in power, who's doing wicked things, if they were to repent and seek Jesus Christ and be baptized in his name, he would be my brother or she would be my brother. So we want to be very careful. Be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be ye merciful, even as your heavenly Father is merciful. You know, there was a time in my life before I was saved where someone said something to me about the reality of what I was doing. And it cut me to the heart. And at the time, it didn't feel good, and I didn't like hearing it, but the truth of the matter is, is it led me to repentance. When we speak the truth and love unto people who are committing evil, it might break their heart. It might break open their heart, and the word of life can then enter in and bring them into the kingdom. The way a person is born again is by the word of God. The way that we are born again is by the word of God. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the word of God is what brings people life. And it's how someone is born again and able to see the kingdom. So we don't forbid people the word of God just because it makes them angry. And we speak the truth unto them in love in the hopes that while it might, a soft answer might break the bone, it also makes room for mercy to enter in. The word of God says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. By mercy and truth. So the mercy of God is that he saw us, those of us who are Christians, when we were lost in sins. And he sent his only begotten son to redeem us from our sins because we could not save ourselves. And when we heard the word of God and obeyed it, and we were baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of our sins and filled with his spirit, that wasn't something we did. It was the gift of grace. And so then the mercy of God is for us then to manifest the same thing unto the world, to speak the truth of God's word to them in love so that, so that some of them might be able to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins and be filled with the spirit of the living God so that they don't have to be a sinner anymore. We would want this for those who are the rulers of this world who are committing wickedness. We want this for people around us who are mean to us because they don't understand. We want this even for people who revile us, who persecute us, or who kill us for the kingdom of God's sake. We do this because our kingdom is not of this world and our treasures are not laid up in this world. And we don't fear what man can do unto us. Rather, we serve the living God and we fear him. We fear 
that that if we're not walking in the ways that he commanded us to, that we won't be worthy of him. We want to please our Father. We want to to ever more and more every single day walk more in grace, in mercy, and in truth. This is the love of God. I want to close now. Let's go to First John, and First John has a lot to say about this. Let's read in First John chapter four, and let's read in verse starting in verse fifteen. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwelleth in him, and he in God. So we confess this to people around us. We testify about the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ in the way of salvation. And we have known and believed that the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, so we don't fear men, we fear God. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So if we fear what people think of us for telling us, telling them the truth, then we are not yet made perfect in love. We don't want to fear people's opinions or what man can do unto us because of the truth that we manifest unto them about Jesus Christ. We want to be made perfect in love and realize that when we are dwelling in the love of God, then that casts out what fear we might have about the new world order or about the global system of control that is rising to power right now. Let's read now again in verse 17. And herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts, casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? And this commandment, this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, love his brother also. So this is how we walk in dark times, when people are given over to fear and malice and, and envy and bitterness, when people are given over to, to, to serving something that is evil. We, as Christians, walk in the truth of God's word, knowing that the Holy Scripture was given unto us so that we would be able to be made perfect in love. We obey the Scripture and the commandments contained therein, and not because we are anything. Rather, we testify about the goodness of God and how a sinner can be made clean on the inside and no longer be bound to the darkness. We testify of this unto the world, even if they hate us, even if they call us names, even if they call us legalists and Pharisees, we still continue to speak the truth and love unto those around us because therein is the hope of salvation. I pray that this message has been edifying for you, those of you who are my sisters who love Jesus Christ. Feel free to write to me if you have questions about salvation or if you have questions about walking in holiness. I am here to serve you. 
or to comment in the comment section below. And may the word of the Lord go forth today and edify many. In Jesus' precious name, amen.